songwriters, and welcome to the 23rd episode of the How Songs Are Made podcast, where we talk to notable artists about their songwriting process. I am your host, Trey Xavier, and today we're going to be talking to my friends in Amaranth about how they write songs. Today's episode is sponsored by the amazing Distro Kid and their awesome Splits feature. This is the Distro Kid feature that I have used the most, and basically it's just that you can easily split all of the incoming money from any given track or album between yourself and unlimited collaborators. How many problems will this solve between your, you know, the people who wrote the parts of the song in your in your band? The bass player wrote a part that you begrudgingly included in it. He he wants his 10%. Now you don't have to pay him out every month and feel uh, angry that you have to do that. DistroKid will do it for you. Um, obviously, that's a <clears throat> silly example. But um, if you and a friend collaborate on a track, you could set the split at 50-50 when you upload it, and then DistroKid will automatically split all the incoming revenue, and they'll never have to worry if you're holding out on them. Your collaborators will all need to make a DistroKid account, but they're going to get a 50% discount, so it's only 10 bucks. And as always, DistroKid never takes a cut. Check the link in the description for 7% off your first year of DistroKid. So, their new single, Strong, the cinematic version, is out now. Please welcome my guests. Guest, guests. It's You'll see in a minute why that's um, a little a little weird. Uh, Olaf from Amaranth. What is up, my dude? Hey, Trey. So good to see you again. It's been yeah. a long time. It's friend. been a hot minute. Um, wow. Yeah, 2019 since I saw you guys last, spent one exactly. of Exactly. Right of, here in Gothenburg, actually. Yeah, spent one of the best weeks of my life hanging out with, uh, with all of you guys, uh, getting to see you shoot a music video and just uh, watch you rehearse. I basically got like a, like a private Amaranth concert. <laughs> I know like for that you guys- That was the best VIP package uh, anyone has ever get for, uh, gotten for as the amaranth experience it was it was <laughs> as a huge fan it was amazing like i because i i was just there shooting video you guys were like yeah we don't usually rehearse that much but we're like trying to do it you know and i just like happened to have my like in ears and i popped it on a little thing and i was shooting just hearing everything direct injected into my brain and i was like this is it this is the top anyway i had a great time so yeah, <laughs> yeah i remember great. we play, played a bunch of songs for the very first time because um the uh, occasion of the matter was that we were preparing to um, to do the festival uh, shows for 2019, if I'm not mistaken, and at the same time shooting a music video at um, Patrick Uleus's, um, yes. uh studio, basically. And we were recording the countdown video as well, if I'm not mistaken. Was that mm -hmm. it? I think so. And yeah, uh, I think it was two or three songs that we never played before, so you got to hear the absolute premiere of it, the number one. <laughs> yeah. It live was, premiere that is yeah it was pretty great and um you know hopefully i'll get to come back hopefully i'll, I'll get to see you guys play again soon that was um that was the other thing because after that it was like oh, okay well i'll see you guys like reasonably soon you, you're gonna have it uh do a u.s tour and then absolute Boom, plot last twist. yeah big big plot twist all the way around so it was the nefarious little pathogen called uh, COVID had something to say about it. Yeah, yeah. So as as exciting and cool as it was for me to come and see you guys, it was as big of a bummer to not get to uh, see you play on tour, see all the new all the new songs played. So I got to you know I got, it was a little fifty fifty. Um, but long story short, I am a uh, as we've talked. I've. Uh, tried to restrain myself in many cases hanging out but here for the world to see i love amaranth amaranth is my favorite band i'm so excited to get to talk to you about it um uh, about all the different things that you do um to make the music that i love so much and i'm gonna um that's all of the fangirling that i'm going to do i am now from this moment forward going to be very professional um but thank you for taking the time to answer all of my questions um th so uh, it is a pleasure to be back with you uh trey and should we take the opportunity to explain about the one or two persons here yes. the fact of the matter is that me and elise did an acoustic uh, live performance at a party on friday and uh, as so happens on parties in general 
there tends to be a bunch of people and they tend to carry colds with them in this um, season in Sweden. It's already getting cold over here. So both me and Elise came down. That's why my voice is a little bit messed up. Elise's voice is even more messed up, but she will join us for, for a little bit. It's going to be a little taxing on her voice too, to sit and chat here for the entire duration of the thing for the, of the stream, but she'll pop by later. So stay tuned for that. Okay. Yes. Um, great. Yeah. Uh, Poor timing uh, all the way around for Trey and Amaranth, but it's you're here and that's great. Um, and she, she, if she's coming, awesome. Even for a little bit, I'm very stoked. Um, so, and it makes it more exciting. When's she gonna come? When she, she come now? Come a little later? Nobody knows. Exactly. Um, so you gotta <laughs> stick around. You'll have to be here for the whole thing, everybody. So um, the big question of the podcast is re really there's only one question all the others are follow-ups of some kind and that is what is the usual songwriting process for amaranth and uh has it changed at all lately for any <clears throat> of the recent stuff well you can say it like this there's some um, different ways to start with a song the general process looks about the same but where we start is the i think the key difference the end result tends to be difficult to pick apart so i think it's difficult for the outside listener even for me to uh, to actually see what process was uh, employed on the particular song but, but i had to reverse engineer it so i know i know <laughs> yeah I know exactly you you're an expert on it now and you did really good awesome job man Thank you. And for the people who doesn't know uh, don't know what we were talking about Trey did an interpretation of how to write an emerald song in was it five minutes, ten minutes, or was that the Dragon Force? No, that version? was no. That I I spent. It was in in three weeks. <laughs> right, 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 right. But it was, so yeah. how to write an Amarant song in uh, three weeks exactly. <laughs> but yeah. but um, yeah, the, the the thing is like this. One of the typical ways to uh, to start a song is uh, us having an idea about it. Me and Elise are the main composers, and since quite a few years back, the only composers for for the band. And we would typically start with a, a general idea. So the general idea can typically be a number of different things. For example, it can be an intro where I set the, the general key. I uh, do an intro with like the, the full setup of guitars, uh, of um, keyboards, of uh, like a general demo production to, to see where the idea is heading. And from there, it's quite, I would actually venture to say that it's pretty easy for Elise to figure out where it's going to go from there. She is fast when it comes to uh, writing vocal lines, and she writes a lot of vocal lines in a very short amount of time. So it's uh, it's our great pri privilege, the both of us, to, to then choose what she's going to um, actually go with. So typically, when we get to the verse first, it's not always the verse first, but let's say that I started with an intro. That's kind of a natural way to progress from there then she will blurt out the first 10 things, first 10 different verses that come to her head. And then the problem begins because they're all typically pretty, pretty damn good. And you often also have stylistic differences, not only differences in the vocal lines themselves. They could be a more modern, more poppy version. They could be a more old school, heavy metal Dio kind of vibe to it. There can be some R&B jam to it, some almost rappy fast singing. So that's where we get to decide, the both of us, like, okay, where, what direction do we want the song in general to, to head in? And obviously, if you already have an intro, that will uh, clue you in to, to how you should continue. And if you have a, a verse and you've already set the style of it, that's going to dictate pretty much on how the song will roll on from there. Like in terms of the, the pre-chorus, if there is one, for example, that gets usually dictated by the, uh, the style and the rhythmization of the vocal lines in the, uh, in the verse. And to, to, to clarify, once you have the, um, once you have the um, verse vocal lines down, it's usually that in turn dictates what the chords should be, if you follow me, mm -hmm. for the verse. And if I have the tempo and if I have the chords, then to write a guitar riff, or guitar breaks or guitar oriented background to, to the verse is going to be very easy to figure out from there as well. But what we typically do as um, 
as you know, that I'm heard. I mean, this is not an absolute truth, but maybe in 50% of the songs, I like to leave a lot of space for the vocals because typically an Emirates intro is very intense in terms of uh, guitars, keyboards, etc. So then it's good to remove a lot of the musical elements, uh, instrumental elements, and then front the uh, vocals by taking a step back in terms of uh, instrumentation. And I think this is really important, and that means that you can put the um, you can put the vocals pretty loud, but they will actually sound even louder with the master compressor and everything on it. So it will catch your attention a little bit easier. Sometimes, uh, like with the song Drop Dead Cynical, uh, we scale away the music almost completely. So it goes from really heavy guitars, really big arrangement, keyboards and everything to almost only Elise or almost only Nils. But Elise in this particular uh, example, but to speak of uh, some of the other ways that we, we can start a song, for example, a couple of songs, not, not only a couple, but a few songs uh, from the Manifest album, Elise was actually setting the um, fundamental chord structure, the key, and also the vocal line entirely by herself. So that was also really, as a composer, I assume in that case, almost the role of, of the arranger, which I find uh, really, really exciting also, because the, the tempo, the key, the vibe of the song is already set in place. So now it's up to me to kind of twist it and bend it to where, where my mind thinks it should be heading. And a couple of examples uh, of this from uh, the Manifest album is uh, a song called Make It Better. Also strong as we released uh, as a single, it's very much like Elise oriented composition. And the really cool thing is that um, she thinks a little different uh, harmonically when it comes to uh, like doing the, the chords. It's not super different, but it's a little bit different uh, than how I would have done it. And instead of going in there and like correct it to what it should be to, to my mind, I actually stuck with the, those chords and arranged it from there. So that's a really cool way to, to be working as well. And then we have the uh, third version uh, of us starting a song. If, if I would categorize it into three different main versions. And the third version is uh, really common as well. And it's just me and Elise sitting down together uh, at my place in the studio, right where I'm sitting right now, actually. And we just start to jam. She starts to sing something. I have the guitar or the keyboards just next to me. And we just see where it's going. So we, we did that a lot on the Manifest album as well. And that's also usually the quickest way to, to get things to appear. Uh, oh, real quick, she's a, actually, a, she's trying to jump in. So let me, uh, let me let her in real quick. Right, 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 right. Let's see if it worked. Let's see if she pops up. Oh, Got I have an Elise sign <laughs> on Zoom. <clears throat> I see your name. Do you hear me? I can hear her. Yeah, I can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. We have a song. We have a song right there. Hi. I can see your name. <laughs> wow she never taking it notes, taking so notes. Sick. <laughs> we did it you want to see me well here i am behind the name is a girl from sweden i am here i hey I'm here. I'm I'm in pain but you can't probably notice me we can still say <laughs> wow what a, what an entrance right off the bat two words in we're already writing a song how are you doing great to see you oh well amazing to you well this is the fun thing i have so much pain in my throat i don't I'm know so if all sorry it yeah like i already did illness going around but i can sing i can da -da -da -da. like up here it doesn't hurt as much as when i talk well uh that wow that's really interesting it's it oh, hurts less I should talk like this. yeah maybe I maybe just sing the whole interview then um, yeah exactly <laughs> well i'm taking notes what's that uh, vocalize are good enough <laughs> yeah. i can just talk like the opera singers talk they always talk well olaf so nice to meet you <laughs> i've been looking forward to meet you a long time though <laughs> um cool well we're uh we're, so we, we were just talking about you, if you can believe it. We we're talking about, um, just to get you caught up, the, the, really there's only one question on the podcast, and that's um, how you, what the process is for going about writing Amaranth songs. And Olaf had just dictated a couple of 
or t- talked about a couple different ways that you go about it. And then he was talking about the 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 third way, which was that you guys will just get together and kind of jam on it. What was, I I was I was a little distracted because I was uh, trying to let you in. What, what was it that you were saying, Olaf? Exactly like that. So uh, to catch you up to speed, Elise, uh, the three different main versions is either I start with some kind of musical idea, then we sit down and continue it. Second one, you uh, write some uh, chord progression and record some vocals uh, at home like you did with Strong and uh, make it better. Number three, we sit down and uh, jam together at my place and stuff gets created. Something like that. In the, that's the long and short of it. <laughs> Maybe... Um... Since we've got you here now, maybe you can tell us a little bit, uh, uh, Elise, about how you did that for Strong and uh, some of the other songs that you will write the the basic skeleton for at home. Okay. It goes usually like this. Um, <clears throat> I try to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> like, I try to go to bed and sleep. And then I just hear, no oh, may love to stay, no I'm not perfect in any way, nothing wrong. Oh, then I just hear the song in my head. So basically, usually the songs are about something I feel or experienced in the near, in our stone the tid. In recent memory. Yeah, in recent memory. Um, so when all the distraction disappears from our everyday life and uh, the, the unconscious gets more um, visible in your mind or, yeah. And then I just hear things and uh, then I usually just record them on the iPhone, you know, this voice memo, which is amazing, which I, kn- I know like most Top liners at least use that. Um, almost every top liner I ever met ever have all their stuff on the voice memo. Like very famous ones too, very sm- also everyone. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure maybe Max Martin even do that. Maybe we should. That's him. what a lot of uh, guitar players and metal do as well. They uh, sit and uh, play riffs and they record whatever is uh, good. There was some drama about Kirk Hammett losing his phone with a billion ideas on it. Not very unlike you, I think once you lost your phone with like a thousand ideas on it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I never forget that. That was terrible. That's the the, the, the negative part is that you could, if you're... But I, 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 I keep my phone extremely safe nowadays because I know that it's very valuable, like the stuff I have here. Worth paying uh, for the uh, automatic backup, iCloud backup, I think at that point. Well, yes, exactly. Of course, yeah, yeah. It's definitely worth it. <laughs> I'm always yeah, shooting have- video when I so that I don't forget how I played the a guitar riff. Um, so I'm always <laughs> using the video, which takes up way too much room. I got to start using the voice memos instead. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what we've been doing as well. When we've been showing ideas to the rest of the band, we could kind of just film the screen, because then you get some automatic compression instead of me having to like do any premixes. And I, I can tell when I'm uh, sending over video to, to other people, like, hey, listen to this. They always like it a little bit better if it has that uh, iPhone video compression on it. That's actually true. That's yeah. funny. Uh, well, um, it's not far from the truth, actually. Like, that most songs I've written is, has been created between, like, noon and 3 o'clock in the night or some, somewhere extremely late. Which you could think is like a little bit unfortunate, but if you talk to like most creative people, that's what happens. It's so annoying because you don't, we can't control it. It just like comes, you hear it, and it's like, oh my god, this song is so good! And like I have to record that. Uh, I can even hear this arrangement sometimes. Like I can hear an entire song in my head, and then of course I try to record it, and then I send it or I show it to Olaf, and he makes the chords, or I do some of it on my own with the piano, maybe the next day or so. Um, but yeah, sometimes I do actually decide that, okay, let's write songs today. And then of course it's the easiest ways to just start with a chord or like a few chords that sounds nice. And, um, yeah, I think it's really, then it's even more easy, I think, to write 
uh, some kind of melody um, with with a piano. Okay, so you you uh, you like having a couple of chords to start on top of rather than just with a melody and then add the chords later. If I can say what I think, I think you usually hear the melody in your head and you hear the chords in your head and then you sit by the piano and you try to figure out what you actually hear in terms of chords. Or? <laughs> oh my God. Just... <laughs> it went right out of her brain. No, but now I start. Like... Now I'm. If I'm unlucky, I record something on my phone, like a very good vocal melody. But then I can't remember the tempo of the song. Nor the, I, like so I started to like uh, snap my fingers now when I sing, so I don't have to, you know, end up in that situation. <laughs> I mean, we've been writing songs for quite some time now. It's like been fifteen years almost. So it's uh, it's funny. I kind of recently explored that issue with the tempos and stuff. And yeah, so I think, but I mean, like, if I decide, if I if I decide to write, I I, I wouldn't just sit like this, you know, and try to hear something. Then I need the piano. Gotcha. But if I go to to bed <laughs> and <try> to sleep, <laughs> then I can hear something singing in my head. Uh, and usually I have the words also then, uh, like the theme of the song. Uh, Lyrical theme. Yeah, the the, the 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 lyrics. The meaning, yeah. Yeah, because it's it could be some sentence somebody said during the day, like when you said, "I can see your name," which would be like such such a great song title in a way. <laughs> I can see our name, and then it would I don't know. You could just keep going from there. I can see your name, but I can't see your face. But I can, whatever, blah 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 blah. But uh, yeah, or something you read in the newspaper, something you saw on the TV. Uh, yeah, like the themes, I think, is like endless in a way. Because every day you experience something new. So you sort of... <laughs> go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, it's like, it's just the, the, the unconscious, like the mind that it, like, collects information. And then we take it out in, in a song um, or music or... I guess every artist works different. It's, it's, if you're a painter, maybe you saw something, but you didn't really notice that you saw it, but then you write, you get the inspiration to draw something and you maybe draw something you already seen or you see it in your mind or, or whatever, or in a scary movie or in a, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, exactly. You're, you're trying to creatively ex explain something that is not easily explained in normal words or normal sentences because you can sit and talk and talk about like something that you saw or something that you experienced, something that someone that you met, for example. But it's yeah. with the language of music or with the language of uh, painting that you can express uh, emotions in a much more direct way. And I think that's that's really essential to songwriting, because otherwise, if you're just constructing parts or if you're just thinking in terms of a pure harmony or what keyboard sound should I use here or what exact words will sound good here, then you go always going to end up with something that is quite stiff. So you need to uh, inject every song that you do with some real meaning and some real soul. Yeah, I think that's the that's the driving force for every artist that you don't. Um, it's it's not it's not. I don't think it's easy to force it, or I think it's almost impossible to force it in a way that you have it. You have a need to do it, and that's why it's such a rare choice of profession as well <laughs> exactly no but it's interesting what you mentioned also with being uh, conscious about uh, tempo because another thing that i think we do well with this band and that not every band think about is um also uh, what keys uh things should be in because you, you can start start to write a riff as a guitar player you can be re really happy with how the riff goes and then you put some vocals on it and then you try to like shoehorn in the uh, singer and this is, singer has to sing in a very uncomfortable key and whatever. And there's been a million times where both me and Lise together have switched around the, the uh, keys a lot, and not only for the song in general, but we actually tend to modulate and uh, do a lot of key changes within the songs as well. 
we try to cover them up as much as possible so it doesn't become confusing for people. But we had that with um, with a bunch of songs. Like we had a ballad on the Helix album called Unified, which uh, contains seven, eight key changes, but none of them are super noticeable. They're just there in order to to present the perfect um, intervals and the per perfect uh, different pitches for the different singers. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's really important to work with. So some choruses, you can have a phenomenal vocal line. You can have a great chord progression in the background. You can have a um, great arrangement with the keyboards and guitars, but it still doesn't work at all because the, the singer is singing in a completely in the wrong key. And then that's the good thing since Elise is both a composer and a singer, then we can actually sit and work on it together. And you can um, take all the keyboards, you know, we work in the Cubase normally, take uh, all the um, keyboards, just transpose them, keep the drums, have Elise sing along to it and see, is it better now? And if it's obviously better when she's just singing along with it, then that's what we roll with. And guitars be damned because I can all, always adapt to playing in F sharp or G sharp instead of the uh, E minor comfortable guitarist key. And anyway, that's gonna also make um, all your different songs sound a little bit interesting, more interesting when they're flowing in an album as well. I think this is something we all, always highly prioritized. And it's also something that that is not so guitar typical because you get a lot of guitarists writing albums and then everything is in E minor. And then you have two songs in A minor somewhere in the middle and the rest is E minor again. So we, we, we try to think about that when we put together the, um, the track list also. So the, it, the next song always sounds a little bit fresh. I think it's fine to have two or three at the most songs in the same key, but if they're also in a similar tempo, it's gonna start to sound samey quite quick. And you might not notice that uh, as a casual non-musical listener, but your brain will. Man, in uh, in like the <clears throat> early 2000s, the whole metalcore thing, there would be albums, whole albums of these metalcore bands, and they're all in C minor or like C Phrygian because they're tuned to drop C. And <laughs> it was just... Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. It was, it was and I mean, bad. sometimes sometimes that makes perfect sense if rhythm is what what is the core of your band, then, you know, that's fine. I think there's a couple of Meshuggah albums where they really did that consciously. They didn't want to do any key changes at all. And that everything was on the lowest string with, you know, a few exceptions, of course. And uh, and that's super cool because Meshuggah is a very rhythmically based band. It's not about melodies per se, not at least not traditional melodies as as we approach them. So I think it, uh, it's really up to see what your what your style of music and what you want to create dictates for you as well. I was also going to add uh, with the with the songs when we write songs that uh, sometimes we change the lyrics if we find a song be like with the melody and the tempos and everything is good but maybe it's not so fitting for the album or the, the theme of the album or amaranth in general <laughs> uh, and then we can all, all also sometimes we change the or usually we do make a lot of changes in the lyrics after. Yeah, exactly. Because uh, often when we are singing along with a chorus, often when, when you do like the chorus singing, uh, Elise, you very often mention some words and maybe I add some words there and that gives you, you like the general idea. What, what is the feeling that you want to convey? But sometimes that can be blabbery, blabbery words. And then you kind of want to make some more coherent sense to it. But it was a uh, very interesting way to work with um, a song called Make It Better which started a lot more like a ballad in both uh, rhythm and uh, tempo and lyrics. Yeah, exactly. Fun to kind of, uh, could be kind of fun to actually play a little bit from that, which was the original song, uh, which then turned out to be the way it is on the album. Did well, you find it? find it? Right. Now, so uh, the, in that particular example, make it better. It started it like a like a real ballad, and it, this is the way that Elise approached it. But uh, I think with many songs, many fast, like let's say power metal songs, could probably almost, if you lower the tempo, sixty BPM, almost any, let's say, Freedom Call or Stradivarius song could also be made into a, a really epic ballad. Also, so it kind of depends, and vice versa. You can often take the ballads, speed them up, and do something really catchy with it uh, as well. Very true. Trying to think of a good example. <laughs> uh, 
hunting high and low. Right, and now. Wow, I'd pay to hear that. <laughs> and some piano on that, and now also change the um, uh, lyrics to you all I ever know. <laughs> and then some piano. And then, you see, you have a ballad. So this, this is really, it's not something that we typically do a lot, but sometimes you, you can hear in your head that, okay, this song is awesome in its current interpretation, but it deserves to maybe have a little bit more of an um, emotional theme and make it more ballady or vice versa. Because with the, um, with the Make It Better song, what, what we ended up thinking was that, yeah, it would be really cool if this song had like a marching tempo. And it's pro proclaiming our manifesto, how we approach life and not necessarily politics, but personal philosophy and stuff like that. And let each singer sing out their manifesto in it. And it turned out to be a really cool idea. It's really unique in the in the catalog of Amaranth, I think, um, for just... Uh the structure the feel the tempo if it felt um i mean it, i i think everything you do feels very cohesive like i don't think there's anything you've ever done that felt out of place to me um there's a couple <laughs> like definitely ones that maybe were a bit out there but i don't know it always sounds like amaranth to me uh but that one has a a, a really unique feel um i think and uh, that's yeah. cool that it was. It started out as something else, and you kind of changed it up to have a certain um, kind of a sound. And it works. It's also funny to to, to see the uh, the progress of this uh, song because when it starts, like in its very early concept, like in the this case, it started like a ballad in Elise's brain, and then we take it, you know, to the studio. We arrange it as a like marching song. You bring it into the uh, real studio, to Jacob Hansen's studio in total isolation for, for three months. And like already when we were arranging the song, we were kind of imagining, okay, so what will the pyros be to the main riff here? And also <laughs> like, where will the pyro hits be in the, in the chorus? And it was really cool to see that whole thing go uh, full circle. Like same thing with uh, us with the song Archangel as well that when we finally stand on stage in, in Finland in 2021 and you see the, the fire and you see the 15,000 people digging along with it, you can kind of feel that, okay, your little song baby grew up and now it's standing on its own legs. So it's a, it's a good feeling. <laughs> I will often imagine what the music video will be as I'm writing the song, just to have a kind of a visual to go along with it. So that's... Um, have thinking about the the pyro and the like and what you said earlier about like the master like the compression on the verse being different and stuff like that to make it pop um that's funny because that's not stuff that you like necessarily think about when you first start writing songs you're so into this all this other stuff you like just like making sure that you have chords and melodies that work and but then as you start to get better at it you're it's more visual like there's more that helps with the the sort of the feeling of it and stuff. That's um, I can I can imagine where I think the the pyro would go in the chorus too. Is it like? Yeah, it's boom boom pa. Yeah, yeah. No 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 no. Fire fire fire. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, exactly. We did that. Uh, uh, I think it was also like, I mean, we have. I have a few memories, not, I can't, because I, do you, or do you remember how we wrote like every single song from the very first album? I remember, for example, not like, really, but I remember a lot of them. I would say the most, but go on. But like Stardust, I remember extremely well. Mm -hmm. I have seen no, now I left the star. Hey, universe, your stardust leads the way. Hail. I remember I just like it was probably also a ballad. If I re yeah, if I remember correctly, this was um you had like a voice memo with a bunch of different um ideas on it, and uh, Elise was kind of playing them all in a row, and then this vocal line comes and I'm like, holy, 
holy moly, this is awesome. And it was quite a bit slower also. I think, yeah, like you said, maybe a bit uh, more ballady. And then I was like, yeah, with a little bit of tempo and some double bass here and some cool rhythmization, then this will really, really flow. But uh, Elise, I also have to point out what, what um, Trey was saying, imagining music videos, because this is this is almost key part of uh, us uh, writing music, is that there's there's a lot of enthusiasm, not all the time, but when you hit that magic spot, like a great chorus, something like that, and when Elise gets energized by a great chorus, for example, she will quite often fly up and start to illustrate, like, okay, this is how I'm how I'm going to move to this song live like a proper cabaret artist, like a musical artist. This is how I should move in the video. And yeah, and imagine me with this kind of uh, clothing on it. And I'm like, yeah, I see. I absolutely see. Because this is also key to how I'm going to arrange it. She imagines this in a specific way with certain um, uh, color themes and dressing in a certain way. This also dictates like, okay, I, how I should approach it in the final product when it comes to um, arranging keyboards and yes. these things. Wow. So I always get a um, get a rendition of what the new music video is going to, going to look like in real time. Yeah, I think that's. I mean, it's the same when we wrote like this kind of more the songs with more attitude in them. It's like yep. a little hard for me to sit down then and write those kind of things. It's like when I was like, "Face it, I told you I'm on fire." Also, I need to like feel it or like I need it to like a drop that's very confounded. But that, that's like mostly with the, the rhythm and uh, I love this like three three bits, uh, three three steps. <laughs> How do you call it? Ah, okay. Oh, this like is a dancing attack. technique for um, you uninvited. I would be one of those. <laughs> the, also, three. Uninitiated, I mean. Three attack. Oh, you mean, ah, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. In uh, like songs in 6 8 or with yeah, a triplet feel. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Those are so great to dance uh, with. <laughs> gotcha. The, the, so the you got to, yeah, you got to feel it in your body and that informs the whole. Yeah, I think, like, for example, songs like Drop the Cynical, me and Olaf would never have written that song if it wasn't that, because it was like usually Friday night or something. And we create always our own party because we never, well, we stopped going out like years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and if we couldn't have felt it, then, then you want to write. I think maybe that's also one reason why we wrote most, have been writing mostly up tempo songs. Because we're like, as a, you want to just move. And then when you also move your body, I think, I think uh, it helps the mind, the brain to think and to create when you move your body as well. I don't know about other metal artists and songwriters. I don't know if they move, but if you don't, or if you're planning to, I don't know who's actually watching this, but yeah, professionals or not professionals, try it out. Try to move your body when you have a like, you want something, you're like, if you do this with your arm, I promise, because we have so many like, yeah, you should try it. You should try yeah, I'm gonna do it. I gotta get better at dancing, anyways. You can't. I can't be out here <laughs> with weak ass moves, you know. It sends signals to the brain if you do like this with your arm. You know, it's gonna. It, so it kind of awakens. I think that's my theory. I, I think you're coming. Yeah, yeah. Such an energetic band because we're not sitting like writing songs like that. We're like, okay, it's Friday. Let's like, bring out the candy or. <laughs> exactly. I know whatever we're doing and then we're like I want a really good song like I need a party song or like something which keeps me going or maybe you're angry about something which happened during the weekend or yeah and then we're just like oh. or yeah I, the, the automatic we wrote that in a hotel room I was thrown out of my apartment and I had to move into a hotel because they were doing construction and uh, <laughs> it sounded more dramatic in the beginning <laughs> um, and then we just like went to the hotel room. I wanted to, yeah, get a good, getting, get in a good mood, and we wrote the automatic. It's who I am, I wanna be, I wanna be automatic. And then we did it only with vocals, and you had a little, uh, the little keyboard with you. So we didn't even use the guitars then. 
Exactly. And that's, um, I think this is an interesting aspect in general uh, about what you said with, with, with the dancing, that I think a lot of metal artists can, can say, yeah, but I don't dance. But I think the point is 100% there. I think every aspiring songwriter who's, you know, plays the guitar or maybe plays the drums or whatever, when they really like something, they, they can feel it and then they start to move to it. You've seen it with a million different uh, YouTube songwriters, for example, when they get into the zone. And if the music has a group that makes you want to move it means that you're uh, you're on to something because so at the I end of the day if like if yep. you like move you make sure you create a track which you can that fits your mood that's most yeah, right exactly and not the other way around that's cool I'm, I, gonna, I'm gonna have to try that a lot more yeah. because i i have, i feel uh like when you were like i don't you don't write songs like this I was like, oh, God, that's exactly how I do it. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> I guess I, I guess that there's the part of the song where or the part of the process where you kind of have to do that. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but it's not the part where you're getting inspired and and coming up generating material. So and here we're on to something something really interesting, because I think those two uh, processes are fundamentally different processes. So the, the way that we do things is that when we are creating, there's very little of the hmm and the, like playing around with, with small things and blah, blah, whatever. I often record quick demo guitars when Elise is still around just so we get an idea of where it's going. And typically in the demo process, I don't re-record that. So we, we tend to make uh, demos that sound terrible to, to other people. And it's always funny, like when we're showing the, the songs to the other guys, they, they, they have a little bit of a harder time to understand what the end result is going to be. When I hear an Elise vocal line together with my demo guitars and some quickly thrown in Superior Drummer 3 drums, I, I can hear the finished product. I can hear what it will sound with the, um, all the harmonies in the background and the, the, the final production. And I'm like, yeah, this it's going to be such a great song. It's gonna, really going to work. But what other people hear is like... <laughs> <laughs> Something that doesn't always sound so great. So it was funny when um, when Nils joined in on the um, on the Helix album. That was the first album process that he was part of, and I was happily showing him some tracks uh, at my home studio, and and I could see that he was a little bit concerned. He's <laughs> like, "Yeah, I, I I don't get all of this a hundred percent." So I, I was kind kind of actually backtracking, like, "Yeah, just for your point of view or point of reference." Uh, here's what the Nexus sounded like, or here's what Drop Dead Cynical sounded like in their initial, like, very first demo phase. And he's like, okay, I feel a lot better about this right <laughs> he was, now. He was like, oh, God, have I joined the band for their Townward Spiral? Is this it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They're jumping the shark. No, but uh, I, I, th I think it really depends, because I think the, it also makes a lot of sense for certain bands that are very production-oriented and likes to do a lot of the productions themselves, like like yourself, for example. I mean, you're aiming for a much more of a finished product in your studio. So for you, it makes a lot more sense to actually sit in your studio and really work on it. And that's also what we end up doing when we're down at Jacob Hansen's studios. But yeah. before that, there will be a lot of um, musical flailing around. Like for example, when I'm recording my demo guitars, I can take two, three hours to record the song properly. like sort of what I would do in the studio, but it doesn't, I don't, don't need it to hear if the, the song or the, even the guitar riffs are working. The same with, uh, like if I record a solo in the demo version, it will typically be the, the very first take, not the, even the second take, because it's just to show that solo goes here and that my first solo idea is that they're actually flowing with the song and that it fits the song to have a solo in that specific part. And it also makes it much easier uh, and I think this is key, actually, because if you've spent a lot of time working on your demo, you're you're going to uh, be very adverse to changing it when you have to change it. For example, you notice in the studio that, okay, this key didn't fit Nils at all, or this uh, riff didn't fit nearly as good to, to growling as I was hoping, or whatever thing. Like, you can hear that Elise is not as happy with the, uh, with, with the key that we chose in the studio as we were uh, in... Um, when doing the demo, then if you haven't spent a million years working on your demos, then you're not going to be adverse to fixing it because you didn't spend so much time doing it. 
in the first place. You might have spent a lot of time composing it, but to transpose something, it takes two seconds in Cubase these days. So I think it's good to, um, to let the songs be flexible until they uh, are actually recorded at the end of the day. The same thing actually even goes with uh, rhythms. I can spend, I typically spend actually a lot of time thinking about like the main riff rhythms and also the rhythms like beneath the vocals, how do they go in general? But more than relatively often, let's say 35% out of the times so he will change it to something that is more drummer friendly and maybe to, to a rhythm that is more catchy. He sometimes also just simplifies it. Sometimes he makes it more complicated in order to make it more um, interesting. And for me, it's all about like, okay, yeah, in, I would say 98% of those times, I will just say, okay, we roll with that. Because I didn't spend a thousand hours like recording perfect guitars to it that could potentially be reamped now that we're in the studio anyway to save some time and, you know, these things. So I think the, um, the, the songs, as, as a songwriter, at least the way that we work, I think it's really important for us to have a flexible and open mind until the song is set in stone and mixed and already mastered and sent off to the label. That's when everything is 100% decided. Until then, anything is open if it's for the betterment of the song. Because, um, yeah, just to add, because I've heard a lot of uh, other bands' demos, and to me, they oft I, I can often tell that, okay, so this is exactly it in the guitars and in the keyboards and in the vocals, exactly how they will record these songs in the studio. They just like set down the blueprint so they know exactly what they're going to play. And I think it also has to do with the nature of how much time you have in the studio. We're quite a fortunate band in the sense that we've always had the opportunity to spend quite a lot of time in the studio. And um, the studio, when I say the studio, it doesn't have to be exactly only Jacob's studio. Sometimes we do this a little bit split up over different studios. We did that with um, recent singles like PVP, for example, where um, uh, everyone recorded their vocals in Stockholm, for example, but the principle remains the same, that we will typically not use stuff that we recorded in the home studio. We, we like to, to do the things for real and take a lot of time with it in the studio instead of having that time being spent when doing the demos instead. So... In that sort of sense of working very quickly during the writing process, and uh, at least before you joined us, Olaf had also described how quick you are with coming up with parts when you guys are working together. You'll just like spit out 10 different ideas for melodies and top lines. Um, yeah. So that's something that I talk about a good bit. Um, when talking about songwriting and I actually don't really feel like I'm that great. I mean, I'm definitely not that good at it. I can do it a little bit, um, but I uh, tend to like, you know, come up with a couple ideal ideas and then agonize over it. But um, I have always very impressed and, and sort of jealous of people who can come up, who can spit stuff out on the spot really quickly like that. Maybe Elise, you can give us a little bit of an idea of how you reached that, that point how you got to a point where you're able to do that kind of thing um is there anything in, that you think you could tell like up and coming writers who want to be able to do that okay well i have kind of a boring answer to that <laughs> and that's the ten thousand hours principle because in the beginning of our career. I remember, um, well, I mean, okay, to, to begin with, um, songwriting is in my family that I grew up with uh, my mother who was a songwriter. My grandfather was a guitar, a jazz guitarist. Well, he was, of course, inspiring my mother because I, I never met him. My grandmother was also like writing her own songs. Like my, my mom wanted to be a writer. Uh, but we, she wrote songs like almost every day at home uh, about the things which happened. <laughs> so, I mean, actually now, since we're having this interview, which is very specified on the songwriting, I guess all the credit goes to my mom because she was the one. I mean, I wrote songs when I was going on my way to kindergarten about that I was going to kindergarten. And like she was writing songs about my grandma and grandpa and grandpa, so everybody. And I still remember those songs. So they were obviously like catchy songs. <laughs> <laughs> and, Good um, as jams. 
about the weather or if we were going to buy ice cream and if, if this song also about everything it, it was all about music and also then to write songs like to create our own songs my brother became a songwriter and uh, also my sister <laughs> so we're all just creating our own shit and uh, i guess that was what i really valued in a way uh, more than being a singer and uh, just being an artist uh, even though i wanted to be a musical artist but i always had this that i had to write my own things. I never wrote diary, but I wrote songs about stuff that happened in my life since I was very young. Like I have, I have so much stuff recorded. Um, yeah, and my first like heartbreak and blah 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 blah, like all this stuff. Uh, but of course, back then I didn't really plan to like, you know, give it out or it was mostly just for a, a driving force, like a need to be able to. I think it was like self therapy also. Uh, to be able to just get stuff out or if I came up with something really funny. Um, then, of course, I, I started to kind of, I've kind of found out that it's possible to work as a songwriter. I kind of figured that out later. Uh, yeah, when, when I started to meet people in the business, I... Um, yeah, since I was dancing and singing in this cabaret, uh, I met people who was like um, asking me, well, aren't you going to be a pop singer? Aren't you going to release? Like, I know these songwriters here and there. And I was always like, but okay, yeah, that's cool. And then I went to many studios working with, like recording other people's songs. So the, there's also a lot of that uh, stuff in my in my baggage. <laughs> <laughs> from my past <laughs> and I didn't really like the songs like usually I didn't like the songs you know that's when I realized like okay shit I'm really fucking picky like I don't like I loved actually most of the hits which was playing on MTV and stuff like that I loved ABBA I loved Queen so I knew also quite early still what I what I thought was good and what I didn't like because obviously um yeah, I guess songwriting is just so personal and it comes probably mostly from what you actually like yourself, um, which why, yeah, the world has like some top, top songwriters, like the best songwriters in the world. I mean, if you're going to get, go down that slippery slope no i'm just kidding <laughs> i don't know how to say it <laughs> if you want to go down the drain or like if you want to like go down like, that path the rabbit hole yeah the rabbit, the rabbit hole, hole exactly <laughs> like the figuring out Max why Martin. and how some people are the best songwriters in the world like what is it well uh, the real question like the... is why the fuck are they all swedish see that's also like it's in the water exactly it's in the water i drank some of the water but not enough yeah, Max Martin and like, what the hell? And you guys? <laughs> and I mean, also such a different, uh, different movements as well, because you had um, obviously the, the pop scene spearheaded by ABBA in the 70s. And uh, later we had our rock bands, which in turn were spearheaded by Europe and bands like that. And then in the 90s, you had the, like the Gothenburg melodic death metal scene. Late 90s, you had Max Martin, Dennis Pop writing some of the biggest hits in the world. And and it goes on from there. Like later we have um, electronic music also seen like um, Swedish House Mafia and Avicii and, and stuff like that. So I think it, I mean, in, in just a few words, I think it began with, with ABBA. And then it's, all, it's often been said that it's connected to our um, musical uh, infrastructure, like the musical schools that we have, for example. And uh, I mean, in my particular case, we, we had access in suburban area that I was growing up with. Uh, in we, uh, There was a rehearsal room that anyone could uh, could use with good amplifiers, good Mesa Boogie amplifiers and a pretty decent drum kit and um, like portable studio and, and stuff like that. I mean, that obviously it helped us a lot. We spent five days a week, every week, rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing all the time. And I mean, exactly like uh, Elise, said before you need to gain your first 10,000 hours in order to to gain your footing that's when you start to know what you're doing and it's only from there that you start to develop an expertise 
It's a little yeah. bit like when you're starting to become a medical doctor, first you become a doctor, but it's only then when you choose your specialization and actually start to work with it for real. Yeah, but it's also when you hear from other, like when other people kind of give you credit for um, that they say what you do is good, you know, and it was actually in sixth grade, uh, like in middle school. Yeah, I went to a music school in, in uh, middle school, which is how old are you? You're like 12, 13, 14 years old. Yeah, that's when we had this class once a week where we got to write or once we got a project to write our own song. It's like, okay, you're gonna write a song. And obviously I did that and I had to, got to decide like what the instrument was gonna play, like the drums, the guitars. So I, it's something already started there. And that's very much thanks to the Swedish school system that they value that as much as being good at other stuff. And I, of course, I could hear that my song was maybe a little bit more advanced than the others. <laughs> that it was a really good song. <laughs> so, Your songs yeah. didn't suck. <laughs> yeah, oh. no, but it was like a solid song, and I have it still on a cassette. Oh my gosh, we got to hear that song. If you can find that. Oh. Yeah, that's what I, I really have to find it. And I hope it's not broken because, you know, these old cassettes that they easily break. Or maybe it's just too old, but I don't have a cassette player, so I don't know. But my mom and mom maybe have saved it somewhere. Because there are places wanna... you can send them in and they'll digitize it for you. Even if it's broken, they can fix that shit. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, and then I just had those songs. And I didn't really, uh, I didn't, um, one of the, um, I played it, yeah. I played I played some of my, my songs, which I recorded mostly with only vocals, like, that I did like 10,000 harmonies. So. <laughs> and then... I played it at my um, uh, school. What is it called? Uh, there's, there's no good um, equivalent in English because uh, I don't really have it in the US or the UK. But it's basically a um, uh, second home that you go to, which is kind of like school, but you don't really do school activities. You just do fun stuff to whenever you're, until whenever your parents come and pick you oh, up at 7. Yeah, like an after school program. Yeah, we've got that. Uh, like after it. school, yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was like a lot of kids there which had like yeah a little bit problematic uh, backgrounds and like maybe not didn't like it so much at home or maybe you know so most there were a lot of very like music in, um, interested people there like rappers and then there was the hard rock uh, the rock dudes and then the, it was me which did this so we were it was a lot of like self-made kind of atmosphere there that and also like I mean, it's many kids' dreams to just like become an artist and then just like take over the world, basically. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I just played it there, and these kids were kind of like hard, hard, hard attitude. And I played some of my stuff, and they like kind of got teary eyed, and they were like, "Oh my god, it's like the most beautiful thing we ever heard! Like you have to do something." <laughs> so of course, that also gave me kind of the self confidence. But then I have to actually say that it wasn't until I met Olaf that I dared to show everything. Because I had like these two boxes at home with songs I wrote, had been writing since the age of, I don't know, 10 or something. And Olaf started to kind of, <laughs> in, in Olaf's kind of way, dig through and like kind of, hmm you know, organize the stuff and like, we could do something with this. I was like, oh my God, really? Yes. And then, um, yeah, we uh, we started to go through and I sang them for you and I showed you like some demos I made with the like people I met along the way from the studios here and there. Um, I did actually only, did I even have any demos or was you the first person I, recorded my own songs with. You didn't have anything we recorded. Uh, and Elise is being a little bit humble about it here. Uh, the first time that I was uh, at the, her place, she brought out uh, the Elise Ideas box and it contained songs, shit ton of them. I mean, they weren't notated, so it was just lyrics and uh, she still remembered them. It was also like a full scale, scale uh, theater play and a bunch of poetry and written fragments of uh, other stuff. And it was just like, this is insane, huge ass box, just filled yeah. with ideas. No, and no, she no. just, uh, there was like some um, song that she showed to me. She was just 
like reading from the paper and singing it, I'm like, holy shit, this is, this is an incredibly good song. And at this point, this was back in 2006, we were already on the fourth album with Dragonland, or right before the fourth album with, uh, with uh, Dragonland. So it wasn't like I couldn't tell, and Elise was really, really young at the time. I was myself 24, and you would have been 20 or 21 at the time. And it was incredibly competent songwriting for um, a person of that age. And I think it was even from a couple of years before that, that it was written. And the, uh, the, the talent was obviously, it was there, it was uh, obvious. But I think I interrupted you, Elise, go on. No, 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 but that's the thing. Like, yeah, I remember now. I never, I didn't ever, I didn't ever record any of my own songs. I only had them um, recorded other people's songs. Yeah, and I think I maybe showed you that. Like, exactly, because uh, the the song that you showed to me, the very first time that you were in my apartment before I even had a studio, I had you recording it on the most rudimentary piece of uh, software. I still remember this song, and it's actually a brilliant one. And it was there that I, for me, that I realized that okay, I need to do something together with Elise. I really hope we can we can work on something together. Yeah. So that that was the seed of working together. Yeah, that's when we decided to. And they, then it was you, me, and El, uh, Elias from Dragonland who plays the piano uh, at Amaranthine, for example, who uh, we arranged the songs like musically, some like three of them. And then we were like planning, like, yeah, we should record this and you will be uh, helping me out and we would send it to some record label and blah, blah, blah. And then we, we, we um, anyways, then ended up starting Amaranth. Uh, because obviously it was more cool to um, do metal than exactly. my sad. <laughs> your your <laughs> <so> sad music. <laughs> <laughs> my sad songs. No, but uh, then anyways, then that's when I started to realize that I started to get some kind of like hopes up and confidence. And then I went to my regular job, which was just like the, the show showbiz art uh, job, like the cabaret show that I did, singing other people's songs and dancing and stuff. And I was like, so so basically what I like to do was to write songs on my free time. Uh, and that's what people learn sometime, maybe in their life, that what if you could actually work with your biggest hobby? wouldn't that be kind of nice uh, so uh, yeah I, it was very important for me. I felt then at the time when I was 20 after writing songs for fun as a hobby that I would that's something I would really like to work with um, yeah so the idea with Amaranth in, in the first place was that I would was going to help out with the songwriting um, to and that you the, wouldn't even be the singer you were just helping with, with writing the songs I like to write the, the catchy poppy stuff because obviously that was my my expertise is is the Swedish pop you could call it or <laughs> whatever it is Swedish music <laughs> um, yeah but then we we, we wrote uh, the first album and then I think at the time I wanted to have confirmation like I always asked you Olaf for example like is this good or do you like this better or should it be like this or should it be like that? You know, I always wanted to kind of have a guide or a guide framework. Guide. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't ever think that I would just be able to decide 100% myself. And I guess that's where we start to go into where I'm at now, where I obviously just decide everything <laughs> myself. <laughs> I mean, I can tell my. <laughs> But I mean, I write songs for other artists besides Amaranth. I can do that because I have the kind of confidence. I know I might even be kind of late when it comes to that because I know some writers who are much more young and we have like Tove Lou, for example. She wasn't very old when she started to write really big hits. Well, you just didn't know that you were writing big hit quality songs because you didn't show them to anybody until you, you know, you didn't, you didn't know that they were that good. Yeah, but thanks for saying that. I mean, for somehow I've been thinking like, what if I was in a, a in a, some other city, like so if I would be in Stockholm, what if I would have met some other kind of people in a much early age? Because I moved around a lot. So it was first when, when I came to Gothenburg where things really started to happen. Um, 
but I mean, yeah, that's the thing. I think it's mostly about that you find the right people to share your ideas with, or I don't know if you would be friends with someone who's in some studio and you, like Tuvalu did, I love her story because she was like, yeah, okay, let's come here and have these ideas. And then you just start to collaborate. And then, because obviously you need someone who can make the music for it. You can not just sit there on your own. Like I have this amazing vocal melody and lyrics, but you need a good band as well. And or a good producer. Um, so so it's it that's I think is the tricky part. But nowadays, since I can call myself a top liner, that I know, like I have my product, which is just basically myself, like every musician or artist or um, painter or guitarist or whatever. You can hear who is who, usually, and I mean that's a good thing. So that's why, for example, when people also have negative opinions about your work it's like yes but that's what i hear like that's how my that's what my mind creates and you can't please everyone because everybody has different taste and that's something like which is really hard because then it would be like okay sure but i could also write these kind of songs which is like in a from a different genre for example i don't know country maybe which <laughs> by the way is very big genre to work for but yeah it's like most important is to always keep there we go like I am. just <laughs> and, and and like i said the, the confidence came it came with just doing it after i think i think it was maybe before we started to write when we were when we were at the when we wrote the drop the cynical uh, I think that album, Massive Addictive. Oh my god, thank you. I think then, like at that time, at that time, I stopped uh, analyzing so much. If uh, analyzing so much that if what I do is good enough. By the way, I just saw that um, Jen Madura, pre previously from a big uh, American female fronted band, stuff by to say hi. Hi, Jen. Hi, Jen. She tells you to uh, not to forget to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we just stop this now? Because this makes me crazy. Because then, also, on the other hand, how can you know that you're a good songwriter before you release anything? And to be able to release something, you need to get some kind of knowledge. Well, we were lucky because we had MySpace and it was free to upload stuff there. Mm. Yeah. It was a good music platform. It was a great way to start, actually. It was a good, good way to uh, discover music in general, also. And now there is YouTube, which is also kind of free platform for people to release stuff. Uh, exactly. Of course, it's not cheap maybe to just ask people to play for you or to... Uh, to get good feedback. Know, someone else can tell us how it's like nowadays. <laughs> and then also uh, I thought that, yeah, for example, Avicii, his story as well, when he was also on some kind of soundcloud or something mm -hmm. where he released uh, mixtapes or uh the yeah the, the same thing as the good old mixtapes which we recently learned about from a swedish documentary that uh, what <laughs> the community did and they sent uh, mixtapes to each other yeah, but I, I miss this uh, smaller more tight-knit uh, community because uh like, like myspace was you went on a band prof profile page, the music started to autoplay, which was in this uh, specific occasion only was actually a good thing. You could also do a lot with the design. So you could present the entire band. You could have a little section for what the band members were. You can also like have a bio. And you would get an in instant idea of what, what the band was about. It's actually rather strange that the uh, Spotify profiles, for example, that there is incredibly sparse they, you have to click your way to things. And I understand, you know, Spotify as a, as a big money-making machine and a big corporation that they want to keep a little bit more clean. And that's also the day and age that we live in, like more Apple-oriented uh, design philosophy and, and so on and so forth. But I remember, uh, just as, a, as an example, I was not aware of um, Camelot until I ran into their MySpace page, which was probably in 2006 or seven, 
something like that, and uh, March of Mephisto was was playing, and they had this red theme to go along with, with the song itself, and it started with the dun 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 dun, and I was like, that's that's so cool. I really like this band because I immediately understand what the, they're about. It's a different thing these days if you're browsing around on on Spotify and. I suppose it's a good thing to let the music speak for itself, but it's also, it's the song that is the most popular that is going to start to play first, most likely, which makes it a self-perpetuating thing. Even if you release a new album, people will still go to your main song from, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. Not always, but it's a little bit typically like this. So I think MySpace was a great platform and you can reach people immediately since you could also send messages. So. What happened was that back in 2008, when we published our first four songs, there was an instant explosion. I mean, we got three record label offers, and back then, uh, it was two or three thousand fans immediately in the first two days, which was back then a shit ton of people. I mean, that was a good, small, little, solid, dedicated platform to start to work with. And from then, it's just grown exponentially since since then. But that is the very seed of the band. It didn't start anywhere else, basically. And it's also interesting to, um, it's one thing with the affirmation and the confirmation, but if, if we think back to it, I mean, before we released those songs to MySpace, we were so ultra confident that it's, it's good when you have that feeling because it's far from always as a you know, recording musician you know, back in the day. I loved the Dragonland albums, but it was different with the, with the Aaron songs because it was a truly unique identity from the um, from the composition of the uh, songs to the composition of the band itself, and you know the the songs that we were about to put up and everything. It was uh, it was a good space to be in. It's been fourteen yeah, years already. It was, Damn it! it. Was <laughs> the best songs um, I ever heard. Also, I was like, why did yeah, yeah, exactly. you this in the past? Like, I love fucking pop. My my brother was a growler, so I've been listening to that all my life, and then like. It was just the combination of the best of the best and then a little bit of the Euro disco keyboards there, which I loved, like Basic Elements, for example. And then it's like, oh my God, it's just everything in the same bag, which I love. And I was always thinking, like, there must be some other person out there who, who has the same taste as I do. <laughs> <laughs> it was. But to, but to speak about that, to, uh, to, to actually go back to the, uh, what do you call it in English, the kernel of the poodle or something like that. Um, about the, uh, Elise and how she writes vocal lines because um, on the first album, it, it was already there, like you spitting out the melodies and whatever, but it's it's exactly like you said, like just my take on it, because you're a lot more knowledgeable which direction you should go these days. And it's um, better quality, quicker. There was more work with it back in the day and it had to be changed a little bit here and you fix them a little bit there. And I think, especially on the last two, three albums, it's now almost instantaneous. Like the, the last few songs that were written uh, has also been the fastest ones to, uh, that you uh, come up with the uh, vocal ideas for. Like an insane example was uh, PVP, which we released um, October last year, I believe. And um, we had set aside an entire day for you know writing only the, the vocal lines. I had a very short, uh, kind of open g guitar intro just to set that general feeling for it, but it could change a lot from there. And you did it in 40 minutes, it was done. And I'm like, there's no reason to continue to work on this because this, this is not perfect. So why try to <laughs> improve on it? It's that incredibly is fast. And I, I, I could hear that within the context of the song that was uh, written with the ideas that we had, with the tempo and whatever, there was no way that it could be improved upon in, in any way. Well, I mean, it, it, it is kind of a hard question to answer, I think, because I thought about it since I also did a lot of songwriting camps. Uh, both me and Olaf had um, Warner Chapel as our pub publishing. And uh, it, it was the opportunity to kind of just write songs and to they help you to, to give it to, to other artists and collect, like put it together. Well, every, if you're in the music industry, you know what a publishes publishing company does also for for actors and uh, scripts and writers and stuff so so i i went on many of, of these camps i started already i think it was seven years ago now um, for my first camp 
and then you get kind of thrown into a room with people you usually don't know well now now i know almost uh, well almost everyone uh, in in the same field at least in stockholm who is songwriters and malmö there is not so many in gothenburg uh, besides metal uh, musicians but songwriters <laughs> as well but uh, so then you get like kind of put to the test that okay you get three hours to complete the song and then my job uh since i'm not writing for myself then at, the, at those um, camps usually uh then you just basically need to make that person decide what they like so your job is to just kind of spit out the ideas and somebody's making the tracks and then you're like okay what about this do you want it to go like ah, up or would you like it going down or down or would you like it to be like da, 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 this rhythm or would it like you and i don't know where that come uh, well that's a really hard question to answer like what where does it come from i get i always say it comes from the universe it's like in the in the energy around you and then you are just like kind of the i always feel like i'm kind of the vessel the, the catalyst catalyst yeah the, the, the voice like someone else is taking over my body and i kind of spit stuff out and that's how i felt as well when we write the amaran songs usually sometimes i don't even remember what i did or said or sang or you know it's just like i'm there and i'm taking in like like i said it comes some, from the un, unconscious mind most of the time exactly i mean it, um we've been discussing many times that it's it's a lot like the songs. Yeah, it's a lot like the songs has always been there. So it's it, you are the uh, the conductor, not conductor, but yeah, the, the catalyst or, or the conduit. vessel for it. The conduit. That's the word that, that I was looking for exactly. Uh, so you're kind of um, you're shaping something that has been there, or at least should have been there all, all along. And I think it's um, exactly like uh, Elisa say. It's your un unconscious. It's as soon as you sit down and start to work yeah, on something, yeah. your unconscious knows before you, your brain knows, like your uh, left side of the brain, uh, because your left side of the brain does a lot of thinking. And a lot of that thinking is actually not so great when you're trying to create. In a part of it, it's actually really necessary, especially when you're arranging complex uh, keyboard arrangements, or let's say that you're doing a production elements or whatever, or you're thinking about rhythm uh like a bass drum pattern for example then your um, the left side of your brain is necessary but when it comes to the emotional core of uh composing i think that to try to listen to your uh, subconscious uh, or unconscious even um it's really really important and i think it's easy to overlook that and it's easy to to let your left side of the brain do a lot of the thinking like is this metal enough is it cool enough is it up to date enough with what the scene kids think like I don't know if people actually think like that. We don't, but, but anyways, and uh, I think it can also come in the way if you think too much, like, how is this going to work live? Because I think that if you feel it and you feel the rhythm exactly like we were talking about before, it will also translate well live. Instead of thinking like, yeah, 135 BPM is a good tempo to move to. That's your left brain thinking, left side of the brain thinking. But if you're listening not only to the right side of your brain, but to your subconscious, you, you don't you act upon your instinct and i think oh, yeah. for me who is who's really very much a nerd when it comes to harmony music theory i spent my good 10 probably more like 20 30 thousand hours uh learning it to, to the smallest detail it's really important for for me what's an important process for me to try to step away from that and actually follow my intuition and i think elisa has taught me a great many things about how to compose music but maybe that's one of the more important things like she would uh, verbally slap me around early on back in the emerald days she still does but she's like oh look now you're thinking i'm like yeah 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 yeah. you're right i'm thinking <laughs> and it's it, it's it's important to, to to let that side go and for some people it's obvious for a lot of people like me for example it's not so obvious and me and elias when we would uh, be sit together in the room and compose, you know, 20 years ago in the early 2000s, it would be two brains working on something and it takes effing forever to reach any kind of conclusion to, to anything. It takes a sweet time to compose music that way. But 
like I said, if there is any valuable lesson we have to teach anybody in, in Amaranth, I think not only for our own stylists, in the conceptual phase, go for your instinct 100%. And very often, your subconscious knows a lot better than your left side of the brain thinks that it knows. Because yeah, always have that instinct, okay, it came too fast, so it's probably not a good idea. Then you turn these ideas around and you end up going back to, to the first um, fundamental idea that you had. That's like a great uh, description of Chopin when he was uh, composing his nocturnes back in the day, when his uh, then girlfriend would observe him. He would start to play something that sounded neat on the piano. He would be very happy. And then he was trying to twist it around, make it perfect. And he would get more and more frustrated until he realized that whatever he was working on was complete and utter crap. <laughs> so he just threw the pages away. And then the day after, he would start from the very beginning, cling, cling, cling. And he realized that he had a good idea to begin with before he started to overanalyze it. The overanalyzing overanalyze, uh, part comes after that because it's an important part of uh, making a good, good sounding modern metal album is that you need to do a lot of small adjustments. Use your left side of the brain a lot. And I think the, 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 exactly the same principle throughout is also um, very accurate when it comes to writing lyrics as well. Your brain or your subconscious knows where it's going. So don't try to stop it. Yeah, I mean, of course, everybody works so different. I also learned that when yeah. I went to camps and I met Which is good. Top liners and they were, like in the end, I got most of the songs uh, came out because they were good, you know? And then I just realized like what I was doing stuff extremely fast and I was using the same method as I always used with the uh, Amaranth and somehow it's some it's a winning concept and, and then I guess that I would always continue that path and I think for people who are writing songs and they find like for the, they write maybe I don't know many songs and some of them are really stands out that they're extra good then maybe try to remember exactly what you did at the time was that something that you woke up hearing in your head? Was it something you worked on for two days or was it something that, you know what I mean? And then you just kind of, you find your own way of doing things. Uh, besides then, if you would be in Sweden and you're on this kind of songwriting um, uh, camp, then you don't have any more time than two hours per song. So then you have to be quick, otherwise you can, you're out, <laughs> no, but, but I think that's also one thing with the Amrit stuff that we have been able to write so many songs and release so many songs. And also like that the sound has changed a little bit uh, during the years. And like the only explanation that we have with that is that because it comes from us. And obviously we grow up, <laughs> no, but we, our experiences and our, everything about us change um, and then that that's why the music has also sometimes changed into different directions. Um, and I think that's normal and it's completely fine and it happens to most bands. And some fans who are not songwriters themselves or musicians, they don't understand usually. Why does it sound different? Why is it not like the first album anymore? And it's like, yes, because we're uh, living creatures. Like we have a cells are changing then we experience things like the years go by and you can't write about stuff which happened to you like 15 years ago anymore. You write about- stuff. And just to underline, there are actual labor camps for writing songs in Sweden. Elise is not making this up. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Songwriting camps, you go there and you write a lot of music in a very short amount of time. Sounds that like a good place to, to you if you fail. Sounds like yeah, a good place to really <laughs> knock out those 10,000 hours, get them- uh... Get them done. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I think something that we haven't uh, mentioned also that I think is really important is uh, to continue to listen to music. Because I know a lot of composers and then oh, yeah. people who work with music full time, they tend to very often say that, yeah, but I don't have time to, to listen to music anymore. And I can typically tell when I listen to their music, <laughs> not to be a critic, but uh, the thing is that music is developing the, the whole time. And even if it's you, you go, you're going back and listening to older music, classical music or music from the 70s or you know whatever floats your boat. 
I think it's really, really important to uh, keep refilling that well that you would drag ideas from because technically you're not stealing other people's ideas, but it's, it's trying, it's like trying to be a good chef when all you eat is really, really bad food. You would never do that as a chef. A good chef eats typically his own food or her own food. So I think it's really, really important to refill that well with other people's uh, spiritual ideas, because at the end of the day, you are standing on the shoulders of giants. And like Elise talked about before, I mean, the, the amount of giants that Amaranth uh, are standing on, or shoulders of giants that we are standing on are numerous from metal bands to pop bands to whatever. And um, I think it's important to not get cynical about that. You know, continue to be a fan, go to concerts, experience why music speaks to people. Because if you're only seeing it from the perspective of a composer, you can get a little bit, your perspective can get a little bit skewed. Yeah, well said, well said. Um, oh, I was going to say something that I thought when you talked about this. Um, oh, what was it? You can think about that and let your subconscious work on it and... Uh, you can continue, Trey. Cool. Well, I've got a, a, a something that I wanted to sort of piggyback off of a thing you said earlier that um, about the how the music has changed, but I, which I definitely hear. Um, I will often binge your entire, um, like, uh, what's it called, discography, um, start to finish, or just hit shuffle and listen to the whole thing, basically. Um, and I can hear the ways in which it's changed, but I can also hear extreme consistency and not just more than anything else. It's a consistent quality. Um, and also um, I know that you've on, I think every album worked with the same producer, worked with Jacob Hansen. Um, and that makes me uh, curious about, not just working with him in particular, um, but any kind of outside influence um, that the band has. And also, um, so far we've mostly talked about the two of you um, writing the songs, but then you also bring them to the rest of the band and they maybe they have some kind of influence on how the song winds up coming out. So um, how about that? Like anything outside of the bubble of you two um, where does the, what, how does that shape, uh, the song, other people's input on it? I would say typically quite little, actually. The, the, here's the thing is that the, um, the core of the song idea always remains the same. When it comes to Jacob Hansen, he's a very musical producer, but that is mostly or almost exclusively focused on him, uh, capturing the uh, sonic aspect of it. So he can he can actually influence the song quite a bit in terms of how it comes out it's sound wise because the production that a song has you can actually steer it in quite different uh, directions how people are going to perceive it uh, naturally I mean if you're a bad producer you can really make a <laughs> good band sound really crappy for example and vice versa of course and I mean you mentioned the, the metalcore bands of the mid 2000s in uh, the US uh, that's a good example as well they all sound the same and they all sound pretty good back then also regardless of their playing skill I might add I think with the, with Jacob Hansen he understands how we want the album to sound from the music more than something that we tell him we typically don't discuss it very much and when we started to work with Jacob Hansen I thought it would be a process where you sit down you discuss in words like, how do you guys want this album to sound? And we would sit there and explain like, yeah, we're trying to you know, go in this direction generally and, and so on and so forth. And sometimes you can obviously bring musical examples for, for A-B testing and stuff like that, but it, he would typically not talk about it. And he, he was paraphrasing that perfect quote that, yeah, but talking about a production is like, it's like dancing about a book. Doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so yeah, so he he doesn't get involved with the um, with the arrangement or the uh, like the vocal lines or uh, like how a guitar riff goes. I I don't think he ever has gotten involved in that because that's typically not his role as a producer. I know that a lot of producers are hands on like that, and it's 
I think it's kind of almost a typically American thing because um, I, I, I don't think it's very few or any of the, the, the things that we put into a song are coincidence. And if you come from the outside and you start to move the different parts around, it's, it might come crashing down. And we are not in no way musical dictators. I mentioned a few examples from Morton Wood range drums that would actually affect how I will play the guitar riff, for example. There's quite a few examples of that where, um, and I would include this more in the arrangement side of things than composition, but people, I know that people define these things differently, but that's the way I see it at least. So if you place um, an end fill to a verse in a certain way, I will, instead of playing the whatever part I was playing on a demo, I will just follow that rhythm instead. So the whole thing kind of really comes together and it sounds more worked through and it becomes more of a band thing, if you know what I mean. These days, I also leave um, the bass completely up to Johan and a phenomenal producer that we're using in uh, Finland, in from Helsinki, uh, Johnny Cruz. Well, Jonas Parkonen is his real name. He doesn't call himself Johnny Cruz anymore. <laughs> he used to play guitar in uh, Santa Cruz. And he's oh, a, yeah. anybody who's heard him, he's an incredible guitar player. One of the best in Europe, in my humble opinion. And uh, so he, he knows where I'm going. I, we played more than 60 shows with Santa Cruz. So he knows our music intimately since, you know, eight years ago, seven years ago. So uh, typically I would listen to that. And if there's any changes necessary, we'll just roll with it. But uh, the, the way that the bass is arranged also comes a lot from Joan's like um, groovy side and his um, like almost punk background. So he tends to be quite, quite loose and uh, it gives a certain vibe to it and it gives it, since there's a lot of rhythm and a lot of, uh, you know, fast bass drum parts in Emirates music, it gives it a little bit less of a, um, less clean feeling and more of a groovy organic sound to it which i think is really cool as well and obviously i mean i think it can also to some degree influence you what other people think about like fundamental ideas that you have and you send it over and they say that yeah but it would be cool if the if there's a halftime breakdown on this song this has happened maybe a couple of times also that i'm i'm absolutely open to general suggestions but it's it's more like suggestions where it could be potentially heading than actual like people sending over riffs or vocal lines or or whatever i think because you mentioned something very interesting and that's consistency and i think from from both mine and lee's perspective this has been important from the beginning that this band is about these core values and while you can change certain things around those core values quite a lot the the um, general idea stays the same I mean, Amaranth is a band that is about contrast, very heavy parts, very modern and kind of poppy, sometimes R&B kind of parts. This is the core. And then you can play around with that a lot. You can go much heavier, you can go much poppier, but it will still, if you remove the contrast, that's when people get the most upset. And I think sometimes we like to experiment with how far we can take it. Like we made some extremely brutal songs and people are shocked when they hear them. And in a couple of um, in a couple of songs, we went all in with pop stuff, and it's typically when we go all in in either direction that people start to get a little like, okay, this is this is different for for you guys. But I think um, it's it's something that I obsess about before every album. Like, okay, so how do we make this feel fresh? How do we make this feel like not repetition from the last album, and so on and so forth. And I start to experiment like like mad on the um, like keyboard and guitar side. And many of these ideas, I don't even show anybody ex except possibly Elise. And then typically a little bit in, I start to dial it back a little bit and bring it more to where it should be, so to speak, to in order to have that consistency. Because when you're playing songs from your entire discography live, or you're playing Hunger from the first album, and then you play... Uh, that song actually live comes right after Digital World, which in turn comes right after uh, Viral. So you have two, three songs from three completely different eras that should still gel together well without confusing the audience. Because I think one of the keys to this is, is that we started the band a little bit later than a bunch of bands from here in Gothenburg did, for example. Like In Flames and Dr. Quillity and Evergrey, they all started out when they were like 15. So you're going to start you know, imitating the bands that you love when you're 16. And then when you're 23, 24, that's when you start to find your core sound. And 
at age 27, 28, then you typically nailed it if you had a van going for, for quite a while. And when, when we started out, we were a little bit more mature and we have had a little bit more experience to know what we really wanted to, to create. So it's, it's, it's been, a, it's a good thing to listen back to the old albums, to play the songs live together and see that there's a, there's a general artistic vision that has stayed consistent without being repetitive, so to speak. Because it, it's a crying shame when I listen to bands that I love, they come by uh, Gothenburg and they play a show. And typically I like some of their older albums, like, like the old school metalhead that I am. And they play no songs from those albums because it doesn't fit with their latest records at all. And everybody gets disappointed, people complain and, and that kind of stuff. So for, for my personal and the way that we have talked about it also, Elise, is that these songs should always work as a unit, even if it's 20 years from now. Yeah, exactly. And then also, like both of us, we of course uh, like other kind, kind of structures than we do with Amaranth, and then we can always do it on the side. That's why I, for example, like love to work with other artists as a songwriter in, in Olaf has Dragonland, where he can go all in with his... Um, um, in, this um, orchestral arrangement and so but we will never let that amaranth will forever say youth just like the youth, youthful just like the name says <laughs> exactly um, never fading and yeah i guess we made a good choice like uh, choosing this kind of more positive uplifting direction because i think it helped us as well to stay youthful and to always like kind of you know exactly it's almost also like the concept of amaranth the band name and the idea and the concept dictates to us what it should be in a sense because i i, I can tell sometimes when i'm just like a little bit extra inspired <laughs> Uh, then I sit and I might even put some strings on it and I go a little bit all in and add some extra part to the C part and then I go like the, the Amaranth entity slowly shakes its uh, big head its cybernetic head and says no, this is not it <laughs> go back doing uh, Amaranth songs, this is not the way that it should, should be going right now and I, I think it's important to listen to that voice also if you're you should experiment, you should be brave when you're writing songs and, and all that, you should innovate, absolutely, but try to remember what, what were the core values of the band when you when you started, because it's still a part of you. Even if you grew up a lot, the core side of it is the core side of your your part of the, of the project, of your personality. I mean, Elise has grown up and changed a lot in the last 12 years, but she has her core Elise self, which is a super fundamental part of the, why Amaran sounds like it uh, like it does, and she could easily tomorrow she could start to write a lot of um, opera style vocal lines and make it really complex, and we could have all kinds of modulations and make incredibly complex songs. But it would no longer be Amaran at all. Yeah. I uh, I'm I'm both I I both love and. Uh, am worried about that kind of thing. You know what I mean? Constantly, because I'm all, every time you come out with something new, I'm always like, "Well, I want to see where they're going next." But if the if it changes too much, I'll I will be bummed as a mega fan, and I kind of hate that because I always want you to do. I want the artist to do what what they want. That's what's genuinely the next thing that they're gonna do. You know, and they're not. Um discounting a, uh, their genuine experience and expression just for some artificial uh limitation but sometimes that winds up growing out of an uh, these urges to do other kinds of things that don't really fit with the main thing so it's awesome that you're saying you guys have these other outlets to to do these things that you want to try in other styles and stuff but amaranth is always going to be the thing that it is even if it's going to change a little bit here and there so i think exactly. i think that makes me feel a lot better as a fan that i don't really have to worry that you're gonna change so drastically even even as you uh grow and evolve the sound you know and i like i said the consistency has been 
so solid throughout your whole discography that um i it's 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 sort of comforting i guess in a way um and uh it's anytime you've changed something or like added or or just uh, tried something different on a type of song um i'm never like oh that doesn't really work i'm always like oh i didn't expect that it works really well um like that song for example um obviously one of your more sort of uh out there for you for the band mm-hmm. out there almost an experiment still just such a great song works so well um and then there's the sort of trio of henrik songs the um the ones that are sort of his like fast yeah. features you know yeah. gg6 and all of those um that i remember being like Oh, they're gonna do like one of these on every album. Oh shit! Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm all in. Let's do it. Like, hell yeah. Um, and that, uh, to me, that always worked, uh, even though it was sort of a, um, yeah, just like something new and different. It still felt like you said it reflected the core values of the band and the writing process. And I guess that brings me to the to a question um, about the future <coughs> of um, of what like what are you guys trying to do next? Is there a um, obviously you are now um, I still I, I'm still not quite over it yet, but you are currently uh, down one um, one of the trio. Um, Mm-hmm. of the triple attack for the time being i assume that will be remedied at some point but um there's uh you know as far as the the band is concerned where uh artistically do you have any idea of where you're gonna go next is there anything that you're trying new uh stuff songwriting wise any kind of new anything or is it just gonna be back to the grind do it the same way that you've been doing it <laughs> no, but I I think it's. I mean, yeah, was, start? yeah, but sure. I was gonna say that. Uh, usually, we like to update the sounds, like try to find new sounds in the sounds, the uh, digital sounds, and I think now we get very inspired by those always developing, changing. And now we recently all have found a new program which has amazing sounds which. I think we're going to use a lot. And then I also thought as a songwriter, like seriously speaking, it would be fucking cool to make like a six minute long song. I know it's not Amaranth, like it's not within the framing, but it would be so cool to have that. At least once we should do it. You know, like the 12 minute long, 13, just to like, but it might not be our most popular song then. It might kind of interfere with the, already existing material so we have to think about that very carefully or we do a side project where we can do that (laughs) (laughs) and then actually i have to say also like confess that we were supposed to write uh, an album during the pandemic like but it was so much negativity going on around in the world so and then the war came and like, so basically we felt like, but this is not like, Am- so since we are Amaranth and like Amaranth is fucking depressed, you know, because Am- we can't, where could we find the positivity? Like during that time, I, for me, it was uh, impossible. And for all, all of us, well, for like uh, personal reasons, having a wife from Romania, which is kind of very close to the border of Ukraine, like we are here, you know, <laughs> it's very close to us. And I just, I, I was like, I can't come up with anything positive, like uplifting positive at this time. Um, so we kind of, we, that's the reason we decided to delay the, the songwriting process. And that's, that, that's how much we also respect our own product, like Amrat. And like you said, it's not only that we are like, yeah, let's do this, like computers, you know, it has to come from us and we have to feel it and we have to be, yeah, it would be the kind of most painful thing ever to kind of, pretend to be happy or kind of create some kind of fake well there is always bad things happening and our that's one thing which 
also was the reason for the ban is that that we had had been going through so many sad things in our personal lives at the time around 20 or so that this kind of music made us it gave us energy and that's what most of our fans also felt during this like life happens life happens and it's not always roses and uh, yeah well we all know that and and but if it's like really like a world thing like a pandemic thing like you know the whole world is like kind of in a kind of state that it was hard to find it was kind of it was extra hard to find something positive like out there um so that's that's why it's so important for us because even if we would go through bad stuff like personally then there is always something else which is so beautiful and amazing and nice that happens you know around us that we have to re remember and kind of try to catch on to and live out i know that people would might some people maybe wouldn't understand this and maybe think that yeah but i mean most of this stuff happens in your mind anyways and you could watch a movie or something where there is like this amazing or you could watch somebody who has been making a great change in the world or whatever and kind of get inspired by that situation or person but if it gets too much where the whole world is like in some kind of a depression i think it was kind of that was the only thing that could stop even us from wanting to start to write at that time like that's much of a organic band we are in a way I don't know how it was for other artists. I know a lot of bands did write and release albums uh, because it was a good time when everybody was anyways forced to stay indoors. But right, Olaf, it's like, that's that's how we try to, like, well, that's how we work. So even if- That's a problem when you are a conduit and you're <laughs> kind of channeling whatever is going around you at the time. and. I think it's uh, you're you're touching on on something that is uh, incredibly important there, at least that we haven't really discussed, and that's the uh, that the lyrical things and the atmosphere of the song should be positive and uplifting because this is um, this is also what the concept dictates in a way. But um, it's also uh, something that makes us uh, unique in the metal scene because obviously the metal scene deals with a lot of really important and at the same time really depressing matters, such as the nature of the music. But there's nothing with metal music that says that, okay, this is 100% law that it should be like that. Because there, there are other bands that are uh, uplifting as well. We kind of just took it to the to the next level and to, to the next degree. And I think it's um, it's important that you uh, that you are in the right frame of mind then to, to write and compose this uh, kind of music. I think it was, um, we had a pretty, uh, it was a very intense run right up till the end of the pandemic, but uh, I do have to say that it was one of the coolest tours that we've ever done, the um, Sabaton tour in terms of uh, the touring party that we were touring with and also the the venues that we were playing. And there was a lot of pretty amazing atmosphere in the air that we brought directly from that tour and straight into the album. For the Manifest album, we had written 20 ideas before that tour that were most of them scrapped. And the album was, it was never our intention to rewrite everything, but that's what we ended up doing. I think it was two ideas from before that tour that actually made it onto the album. But uh, well, when it comes to, uh, to to the future, there's a billion different ideas that we want to try out. And uh, just one aspect of it is ex exactly like uh, Elise said, we um, uh, got uh, recently, <laughs> recently endorsed by a few uh, keyword plugin companies. And so, so now the uh, it's specifically ReFX uh, Nexus. <laughs> thanks to those guys, they gave us every single little plugin that they have in their catalogs. So, so now the the painter's palette is wide <laughs> indeed. <laughs> so there's um, it's it's really cool to be inspired also by just a sound or some like a keyboard sound or a song title or something like like that. But uh, to also draw a little bit of uh, influence and inspiration from from the technical side of things. I've uh, recently started to use uh, Neural DSP for guitars, which gives me a much better instant guitar sound without having to fiddle around with it a lot. So that also helps you um, in the composition process because much more early on do you hear 
like something closer to what the final uh, result is going to be as well. Yeah, yeah. I think now for the upcoming, like now we feel very inspired to write. I mean, now we're going towards at least a bit more positive direction again. So, yeah. Good. I'm, no. glad, I'm very glad to hear that because for the thing that you were describing about sort of the state of the world and it being difficult to to have a positive <laughs> attitude to me <laughs> that's that's when the world needs new amaranth the most you know what i mean cuz to me it's like i can go wow. like oh man so much shit is going so badly in the in the world <laughs> oh. fucking a, a big red amaranth button get me pumped back up again to fucking I clean my house every time. I'm like, oh, all right, I'm gonna fucking clean to this shit. I made a dumb little TikTok about that actually, if you want. Um, but I'm glad to hear it. So you're you're kind of back in the saddle, then, is what you're saying? Absolutely. The thing is that uh, I, I can also hint a little bit towards that um, there are going to be new stuff be uh, being released a lot sooner than you might think. Also. Maybe not an entire album just yet, but there's going to be new music for from us before long, for, for sure. That's before the uh, album comes out, without yeah. revealing it too much. There's some uh, new stuff in the pipeline that is uh, on the topic, a little different from us, but so incredibly recognizably Amaranth. So it's going to be really cool to see what you think about that. Yeah, that's true. In so the... we have some inspiration with that. Exactly. Them. But those are about other, uh, uh, yeah, it's very, it's about a specific subject, uh, which got us pumped and inspired to write. And it's the same with the PvP song, actually, that it was also like about the, we went into this whole gaming world and I mean, how cool is that? And stuff still kept going, um, regardless uh, of, what happened around uh, so so we are will be very happy to release those kind of soon like what we did create during the lockdown uh, but yeah to 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 kind of also allow yourself i mean this is the um be when the more you 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 look at other i think other artists um people who made a big in, impact in, on other people's lives. And then you realize that they themselves um, at some point fell apart or, yeah, we know we know all the stories about great geniuses, musicians and singers and all those. But like somehow that's, that's more like, a, that's more like, it's not at all about the songwriting subject, of course. Uh, that's more about like how the, the whole industry is, is uh, uh, pushing people. So I think a lot happened during the pandemic, like with the uh, uh, that you kind of got a perspe perspective on things. And and um, for us, that we also allow ourselves to kind of allow ourselves to grieve, for example, and allow our, our, ourselves to take this break from producing like a machine, <laughs> you know, uh, which we've done actually. And a lot of people wonder, it's like, there have actually been questions I've been reading somewhere that they wonder if we're lost our souls or something like that we are actually just like kind of some pr producing rabbits or something. <laughs> But uh, we do actually always write songs with, when we feel inspired. And that's also one reason maybe why it doesn't take us like too long. Because when we feel inspired, we meet up, we make sure we make something. Or if we hang out Friday, Saturday, you know, instead of being in the bar, we're creating our own atmosphere at home. And <laughs> like the kind of atmosphere that people seek and that which we also seek to become more energetic. So... It will always be that way. So we will always try to find ways to make sure we're in the right state of mind. So if it means that we would need to take 
six months to go to Bermuda or something, we will do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Band vacation. Yeah, I was like, okay, we need to make a fucking good album. Like, let's go there. We don't have to do anything. We do anything just to make sure that we're not having some... We call it like the worst songs we know is like the tired songs. Mm. Exactly. That's like our secret word. It's like... If we don't should like, never sound tired. Should never sound tired. No, it can't sound tired. If it's tired, that goes out. It goes to the trash. That's Sometimes you got to get the tired song out so that you can get to the the good ones though sometimes you just gotta <laughs> or you just it. make it you just continue another day and you make it untired <laughs> ah wake up wake it up <laughs> pump it up like a good way to do that is always like all i've said is to uh, make it more up tempo mm -hmm. like exactly push it make it better i have i found it actually you did There's demo version you're gonna not believe this it's the same song it has different lyrics but It sounds like it so could be you like, can a, see. like an angsty 90s, like Alanis Morissette or something kind of like, uh, like, yeah, super dark downer jam. It's, I mean, it's, it's nice. It's really nice. Even hearing it, you know, <laughs> like that level of quality, hearing it through your iPhone. Um, yeah, super different, but it, um, so that's uh awesome to be able to hear where it sort of started and where it where it wound up big a huge change uh, yeah. because you can see that the entire seed of the the song is there everything that you need in order to to put together the the, the, the final result that we did is there with the fundamental vocal lines the fundamental groove of it even if it got changed a lot then the idea is there and it's kind of like melancholic, which most of my original ideas are, but then we kind of shift that always into um, the more powerful. I think also you can, uh, to be honest, I think most of the power that we find also comes from dark places. It's a, it's a very strong force, like the like anger is actually the strongest kind of feeling that we have in our body, you know? So, and also like the sadness and the melancholic parts and kind of to use them and turn them into something positive is, is like a very good force of, uh, like, like an energy flow, like a force of nature. And you and have the hard. outlet for, you have that the like different outlets for those with the three different vocal styles you if you you know and so you can write something that maybe doesn't make sense for you to sing elise like uh because like it does i don't know it, it just doesn't fit the uplifting vibe you give it to the you give it to the screams be like now you're the angry part and we're gonna have a conversation something like that exactly and that's also why i feel so 
honored or whatever you call it. Like, I'm so happy that I am, what am I? I am in the metal music <laughs> scene with this extremely powerful vocalist, instrumentalists. And I love that it, it's still the kind of uh, heavier part which carries the whole genre. And that's why I'm so proud about and like why people always sometimes asked um, me if I would become a pop singer or whatever. I was like, how can you become something which you're not, you know? Also from your personality that, well, of course, like a lot of pop also has very deep, um, there is a lot of amazing pop songs, obviously. But it's like, that's where, where I have always had a hard time kind of explain the difference between different genres or why I'm not in a different, I was like, but I am metal. Like I am, it's just who I am. I grew up in a metal world. It suits my, it suits, I, I know that. That's maybe one thing you could say, I know I know the people, I know the atmosphere, I know the spirit. And that's also why meeting Olaf, we clicked so well. We like found each other in a bar and we became best friends immediately because we spoke, spoke the same language. And, and then you can um, kind of just take that as the core and be very proud about it, but then experiment around it and give yourself and the people now who we know are listening to our music, something which stands out and which is kind of unique. And it's not copying other amazing metal bands from Sweden, for example, which we still are inspired by and influenced by, but just like kind of make our own part of combine both worlds or three worlds or many worlds or just make our own world, which the, the Amaranth world, which is like, has its feet in metal. It's the nexus of all those things. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Boom. I bet it would be really exactly. limiting for you to, for you to just to be a, a pop artist or whatever, or just writing after being able to write for three different singers three completely different sounds and styles and uh, things that you can, uh, different ways of expressing, you know, to go to like be writing just for your, uh, like a solo song or something. I, I, that might be, it feels lonely. Yeah, I know. I also, I mean, I love work with other people most about most and all. And also, like you said, like these things that I make when I'm on my own, I recorded this, of course, in the middle of the night, so I couldn't sing very strong. But it's like, yeah, it's lonely. And I don't think I'm, I'm not created to be a lonely wolf. I'm not created, I'm not the kind of person that, it never felt natural to me to do things on my own. I always wanted to be part of a group, part of something. Also, when I did the shows back in the days, we were like a team, we were 12 people singing and dancing together. If you would be, if I would be doing musicals, which was one of the dreams and some dream, I, a dream I still have, <laughs> is that it's, it's going to be an ensemble, like so many people. I would sing with so many other people. I love that. I think that's also one re thing that, yeah. It's, of course, I could maybe record the solo album and release it, but I mean, I've thought about it sometimes, like touring, being just me, dictating telling everybody what to do like <laughs> uh, it's me my show kind of stuff I, i'm not that kind of person well i so i'm i think we found a, a solution to all our problems and that is <laughs> exactly i mean it, it can be super fun to sit and compose by yourself and do something totally different but i mean to do that full time like a film score composer or something like that. It's just, you're working from your own studio at all times. And the only time that you see people is well, hopefully when you go to premieres and stuff. But they're incredibly lonely. 
that's the thing. Like people sometimes I, I also ask you, and I, even I ask sometimes. I'm like, oh, why don't you do movies, Corey? You're so amazing. And that's like he wouldn't have me, for example, <laughs> or the other guys in the band. It would just be you. I couldn't even see you just sitting there in your own bubble because we know that most of those extremely, I mean, it goes hand in hand. I think that most extremely genius people they are lonely wolves and they have maybe some social anxiety and like other kinds of characteristics i'm thinking about like einstein or like the you know all the, <laughs> you can see them there or the, the japan and the motor dudes and the <coughs> and um oh whatever like, yeah i it's something i find and that's also what why sometimes Sometimes you could think that the music um, industry is a little bit like unfair. That it seems like I got this question once um, that you have to be kind of an extrovert to survive in this industry. That maybe there are some even also much better musicians and songwriters and singers out there, but they don't have skill to create a band or they don't know also they don't feel comfortable being on a stage like that is certainly the case in the world which is like kind of don't get this, the chance because they don't know all the other parts you have to be able to handle when it comes to being an artist or a touring band or a touring artist like we are yeah imagine if you had never gotten up the the courage to show anybody all of those songs that you'd written when you were you were really young if you just stayed as a you know like like oh i don't know they're okay i guess and like fucking you were sitting on a treasure trove of gold and this skill that you uh you know didn't have the i don't know didn't have the confidence to share with anybody yet and then and then you and then it was this discovery that happened because you taught showed them to other people you, you you were social about it you shared some of yourself with other people boom there you like um there you Aww. go that's that's uh and that's tr i think that's true of everybody if you've got a skill or or you know you're a creative person and you're making this stuff you have to you have to be willing to share it with other people and put yourself out there that's very hard to do yes my god i love how you're saying that because that's actually true, and it was also in the beginning of our career with the band. I, I was afraid, I didn't want to tell which parts I been, had written, because I didn't want to have anyone's opinion about it. I thought it was awful. Like I wasn't at all, I mean, people think I'm an expert, which I am in some ways, but I also have that extremely personal, like when it comes especially to music, because it's such an, like a naked, uh, revealing kind of, I was like, no, 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 I don't, I didn't write well, did I write something? I don't know. Like a little bit, you know. I was never like, yeah, I'm a songwriter. I did this. I wrote this. I did. did, did. I didn't like that. I didn't like to talk about that. And um, it's a little bit weird, but yeah, it's very true. And I know it's a lot of other people who's like that. Like, uh, it takes a lot of effort. But also, that's why I'm so happy when you you meet the right people who can like kind of protect you in that situation and up lift you up and understand and like encourage you and like so i wouldn't probably be able to do anything of any of this uh, on my own anyways um but now i mean it's so nice to like kind of that's the thing why people watching or listening that you know we all have had those fears we all have been shy i don't i never seen all of shy I'm just kidding. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> the insecurities. I mean, it's a scary world. It's a scary thing to kind of just throw yourself out there. And it feels like you're going to get eaten by a monster. And you, I think especially the like, negative comments can fucking kill you. I mean, we could have given up after our first album. I could have been like, okay, I can't take all these negative comments on YouTube. I will. I just going to leave the band. That's when you have to... Step the fuck up. And like that's when you have to create this kind of badass attitude, which maybe isn't you from the beginning, but you become that person. Because you have to produce. I mean, it's the. Uh... 
and you protect protect your fans who loves what you do and you'd like you have to stand up for each other exactly but it's a, it's the, the inherent problem of uh, playing music inside of um traditionally conservative genre at least in the last 15 10 15 years i mean uh, metal used to be a pretty um, open-minded genre especially in the 80s where there was constantly new things happening and then in the 90s there was also constantly happening you know stuff here from from gothenburg but something that is to take in flames and dark tranquility for example when they started in the 90s here they got death threats because there was not and no comments on youtube this is something that is rarely talked today even they don't really talk about it that much in interviews because it's just such a long time ago it's 27 years ago but it, it was a problem for in flames and um at the gates and dark tranquility to play shows because there was a black metal mob in um gothenburg walking around and beating up people who were listening to melodic metal because they thought it was just gay as a derogatory term yeah it was it was terrible uh, the climate but then yeah, also, yeah exactly and as with amaranth for amaranth especially it wasn't just like me of course being a girl and all that uh getting criticized it was like our music our music because it didn't fit in people thought this is not metal this is not this is shit or whatever like there was so much negativity but that's that's also the thing when you're a songwriter you create creator music creator like we as fans for music music fans we would also love to see someone come up with something unique and specific and incredible like so if anybody has an idea i know a lot of bands like musicians and and creative people uh maybe seek a little bit through others like what works what doesn't work what who you you always want to find some kind of a role model i guess but it would be amazing like i think for the whole industry we would love to, to see if someone has a crazy idea like try it out exactly as i mean if you create start your own band in uh, or if you're making songs at home or whatever it is I mean, in order to get somewhere with it uh, in the metal scene, in, if that's your goal, you need to find a niche. Otherwise, you will most likely be, uh, disappear among the extreme sea of uh, other bands. So you have that factor. You need to be unique. You need to have a niche. But on the other hand, if you have a niche, you will get attacked because you uh, do something yeah. different. And I mean, I think the, the very first sign of Amaranth actually working great as a concept was the reactions that we had when we released uh, Hunger and the reactions were furious. People yeah. thought that we had completely wrecked their entire genre, you know, beyond any hope of repair. And I found it quite hilarious. Not everybody in the band found it in the same way. But uh, I like to be provocative in general. I think it's a good thing. I think it's uh, good for complacent people to be shaking around properly every now and then, because otherwise they get way too comfortable with, um, with their things. And I think that um, it was really interesting to see going from there back in 2011 to 2018, where people were saying that, yeah, this Helix album, it's really good, but I, I, I like their two first albums more because they were a little bit more metal. I'm like, dude, you should have heard the comments at the time <laughs> and the criticism that we got. And it was not about it being too metal, I can assure you about that. <laughs> So to, to see that entire development, I never thought it would happen that people said that they liked the first one or two albums more because they sounded more metal, especially from the interesting point of view that they are not more metal than the last two albums, for example. I would have probably vent ventured to say that Helix or possibly Manifest are the heaviest albums that we've done or the most metal albums compared to the first two, for example. But people are always going to remember things differently because when you're 14, 15, you're listening to, let's say, The Nexus, you're going to perceive it as, whoa, this is so heavy and I can listen to it because it's a little bit catchy also. Yeah. Yeah, but that's the thing. Like, like with this, and that's, I think for us, uh, the best thing about us was that we didn't, we, we didn't try to create an image or copy somebody else or like we didn't try to create, I don't know. We, we, like actually what, what made Amaranth uh, to begin with was the songwriting, like the songs. We wrote the songs first, and then we started to think, okay, well, who should be in the band? Like, what should we look like? I was even trying to like figure out like what kind of clothes do I should I go for? Like, 
but then in the end it was the songs always it's always the songs. that dictate, dictates everything exactly yeah and then we could like that's why i feel like that sky is the limit still that we can still create and develop a lot uh, within our field i mean we also try to just be humans like regular people we didn't put on makeup we didn't i love kiss for example uh, <laughs> we, we didn't decide we didn't decide to go there because we were thrown out so fast so we were just ourselves and i think also that's one reason why we also maybe took it very personal at the beginning when people did criticize us because we're like but we are only musicians like writing songs and then we are here like performing the songs and then we get all these comments and i was like what the hell i found this uh, old uh, magazine today oh actually uh, seven out of ten it wasn't oh is it nine out of ten even it's nine out of ten hmm. in sweden rock magazine yeah, they actually liked it, liked the album. Not everybody from, liked that first album as much as they did. <laughs> from uh, from 2011. Yeah, that's why I bought the, the magazine and saved it, because we got 9 out of 10. And then here on this page, I found this little dude. Uh, oh, it's Nils. Wow. It's mini Nils. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. He's still recognizable, though. He looks like he's about 12. I know, he's so small. We didn't... <laughs> And with this one, we're in the same magazine. And Adorable. Was... <laughs> and when we released our first album, he was there. Like, <laughs> it looks like 10. <laughs> but in reality, he was 13. <laughs> <laughs> I'm practically a man. Um, well, guys, I this... Um, is the longest a podcast has ever gone. I and I feel bad because I promise you it could be short for your voices. And I'm, now I'm starting to feel bad that I'm making you talk. But I, I'm loving every second of this. Um, and I think I um, first of all, this is this is all solid gold to me. I love hearing all of this stuff. Um, hearing not just about your process, but also about the way the the history of it the philosophy of how you go about it and how you're thinking about it, the the freedom that you've given yourself, but also the restrictions, the creative, not restrictions so much, but, you know, the sticking to your guns of how you've gone about framework. it. Framework. You can framework call it, yeah. From the beginning. The, um, you know, the um, the concepts, like this con contrasting sounds and things that all work together super, super well, but are... A, a, a constant exercise in contrast and how you've gone about it um, is incredibly interesting to me. I, I like that wording. Sorry to interrupt you, but a okay. constant exercise in contrast. I'll remember that for future interviews. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I think that's a, a lot of why I love the band so much because that appeals to me um, so much. The con the constant, um, contrasting of elements against each other. Um, what's the word? Juxtaposition. If I was real, exactly. really pretentious, the constant juxtaposition. Um, but it's it really works really well for me, and obviously a lot of other people because you've had immense success, and I hope that it just continues in that direction. Um, would you like to talk about a, a, um, what you've got coming up? in terms of uh, releases and tours, because I know you just announced something this morning and you've got a tour on the books. Let the people know what's up. Oh, of course, of course. We have, um, speaking of Make It Better, that you heard even the more, more, most initial version of. We have a um, version and interpretation featuring Jennifer Hubbin from Beyond the Black, who we are also uh, to segue into the uh, touring uh, plans going on tour with uh, starting October 5th in Vienna next month. So if you are in Europe, join us. Come and see us. Check out uh, amaranth.se for all the relevant dates. Yeah, and we're, of course, planning, thinking, trying to get over to the US soon as well. Hopefully next year. Before long. Yeah, it's been too long. We love it there. and uh, We miss everybody abroad great i will i will be there wherever there is <laughs> awesome awesome um cool guys well thank you so so much for taking the time especially since you're both a bit uh, under the weather i really appreciate you taking the time um and 
I'll uh, be sure to let you know when this goes up as an audio podcast um, and um, and all of that. So uh, good luck with with the release of the new song, with the tour and um, and all of that. So thank you so, so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you again, Trey. Thank you so much for having us in Gear Gods also. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome to be back. <laughs> yes. And keep hopefully up. more in the future. Sorry, uh, what'd you say, Elise? Now that keep up the good work you're doing. Yeah, C congratulations to, to all the progress, the new studio, all the new uh, subscribers and everything. And thanks to everybody who actually stayed this uh, whole podcast. I can see that we didn't really drop that many in uh, in listeners. So that's good. <laughs> Very consistent. Yeah. All right, guys. We also, uh, okay. we also have to, um, we're also very curious to hear your upcoming songs now when you got some, maybe some new. Exactly. Uh, some writing. <laughs> I've, uh, yeah, I've, I've got some new stuff coming out, actually. I, I mean, I've got, I got one that needs a spot. <laughs> anyway, I won't. <laughs> what I've heard, I love, I love it what I've heard and it's also very funny because you're also uh, yeah you're in your songs it's like a different tray but it's you still but it's like funny because it's like we can hear your soul Ooh. have you heard all of it? yes of course but I, I like that that's good I stuff like it it's like amazing stuff fun. But it's like, um, yeah, we want, we want, we, we look forward to hear more from you, and hopefully release an album which gonna be able to come out here in Sweden. You can come over here tour. Thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you made my day. Thank you guys. I really appreciate that. Um, actually, if you wanna stick around on the line for just one second while I wrap this up, um, and I'll, uh, I'll be right there. But they'll be able to hear you if you talk. So, um, but. Th Thank you guys so much. Um, ooh, I'm I'm getting misty. I'm getting misty. <laughs> All right, All right, guys. Uh, I'm gonna uh, wrap this up and then I'll I'll talk to you for a hot second. Um, all right, y'all. That oops, that's the wrong. I went to the wrong one. Um, so thank you all so much for watching. Um, obviously this was a pretty uh, pretty great moment for me. My finally, finally getting to interview my favorite band about the thing of theirs that I love the most, which is their songs and their songwriting. Um, I uh, I was a little worried that like you know I didn't want to like didn't want to peel back the curtain too much because to me uh, I I've never stopped and thought about why I love the music so much and it allowed me to turn off my analytical brain and just enjoy music and that's. That to me is what's so great about it, and uh, I'm so glad that I did it. Um, and I hope that y'all enjoyed the interview. Huge thanks to Elise and Olaf for taking the time, and huge thanks to DistroKid for sponsoring this episode. Um, check the link in the description for seven percent off your first year of DistroKid, and hit up howsongsaremadepodcast.com for all the past episodes of uh, the audio podcast and this will be available very soon as an audio podcast as well and be sure to follow on all of your favorite podcast outlets and uh, enjoy the rest of your week and I'll see you all real soon